One man wanted to win it all. The other had everything to lose. Together, their nuclear missiles brought the world to the edge of annihilation. The island of Cuba becomes the center of the world. Fidel Castro says the Russian missiles are for defense, but for others, they are a deadly threat. For 15 days in October 1962, the world is on edge. Will it be a countdown to World War III? Nikita Khrushchev, now retired, has time to relax and enjoy nature. But when he ruled the Soviet Union, it was a superpower, and his actions affected the world. Now his world is one small garden. Not long before he died, he reflects on his motives and behavior during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy and I are different people. I used to be a miner, a working man. He's a millionaire, the son of a millionaire. We represent classes that cannot be reconciled. His aim was to strengthen capitalism. Mine was to destroy capitalism. planet Earth, four billion years of life, and for the first time, mankind has the ability to destroy it all in one blow. In 1962, the world is divided between East and West. A balance of terror exists in the competition over atomic superiority, a cold war so far. A U-2 reconnaissance plane is on a special mission authorized by President Kennedy. In the cockpit, Richard Heiser. I knew it was an important mission because I had two generals, Air Force generals out there to brief me on the, on the missions. The target, Cuba. They were pretty well convinced what was going on, a lot of the people in the intelligence community. But to be able to prove to the people who were not intelligence people, it took a picture. Show me a picture. A suspicion based on reports that Soviet nuclear weapons might be based on Cuba, with missiles aimed at the United States. Major Heiser is a photographic reconnaissance specialist. With this KA-18 strip camera, he can take thousands of photos in a couple of minutes from 12 miles overhead. It's a risky undertaking for the pilot. I was brief that uh, there was a possibility or a probability that I'd be fired at. The mission was designed to fly as high as I could fly, maximum altitude. And I think any U-2 pilot will tell you that from the time they push the throttle forward on takeoff, the adrenaline shoots. The adrenaline shoots until you land. For some, it was
was hard to believe the Soviets would take such a risk. The Soviets had never placed their own nuclear missiles outside their own borders. They were highly secret weapons that they feared might fall into the hands of the United States and the West. They were highly dangerous weapons and they did not want those weapons to come under the control of anyone else. The photo analysts work overtime. There's three miles of film, thousands of photographs to be developed and evaluated. They're searching for a needle in a haystack, looking for tiny clues visible only with a microscope. One of the uh, scanners noted that there was changes in the San Cristobal area. So he hands the film over to a missile team, and they knew about uh, what the missile sites looked like in the Soviet Union. The sites in Cuba match perfectly. When I scribed the circle from San Cristobal, and it included Washington, I knew that Washington, therefore, was going to be a target, certainly. No doubt about it. I knew that this was going to be a, 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 a his, not only historic, but possibly a confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. These pictures will change the world. Nuclear weapons are at the doorstep of the United States. The President of the United States still doesn't know about the photographs. John F. Kennedy is holding a reception for a state visitor, Algeria's Ahmed Ben Bella. The youngest elected president, John F. Kennedy represents a new hope. He wants to lead his country in a new direction, advocating a more vigorous government. Along with his wife, Jackie, he represents a new generation in America. Jack Kennedy knows how to portray himself. He understands the powerful effect of images. And how to win people over. This evening, all is still quiet at the White House. Now, it just so happened, this was election period, and the president was upper New York uh, state uh, campaigning. And he wasn't going to get home until later that night. George Bundy decided that let the president have a good night rest, and then we'll tell him. would be his last good night's rest for a while. On October 16th, the race against time begins. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy shows President Kennedy the photographs, the evidence. Soviet missiles placed in Cuba can reach Washington in 10 minutes. They represent the gravest threat the U.S. has ever faced. Total shock. Why in God's name would the Soviets do such a thing? They must have thought we would react. At least that was our feeling. Why did they do it? Total shock. the Kremlin. For centuries, it has been the symbol of power in Russia, where czars have lived and where Soviet leaders have ruled. On some occasions, the public is let in to meet their leader, like this reception for workers and farmers from the Ukraine.
Nikita Khrushchev has total control over the Soviet Union. He's determined that his country will flourish once again, that communism will ultimately triumph over capitalism. You know, the whole crisis was really due to the fact that the USA did not want to recognize the Soviet Union as an equal player. Khrushchev believes that putting missiles in Cuba will even the playing field. He replied, what's so special about that? You Americans have surrounded our entire country with missiles. You have missiles in Turkey, in Italy and England. Why can't we do the same thing? Forty-five American nuclear Jupiter missiles positioned in Turkey and Italy are close to the Soviet sphere of influence. Khrushchev saw the American superiority in strategic nuclear weapons. The Americans, together with the French and English, had 5,000 of them. And we had 300 nuclear warheads. The Soviet response is the SS-4 intermediate range missile. It's part of the plan to achieve parity with American missile capacity. 36 of the SS-4s will make Cuba an impregnable fortress, a deterrent to any U.S. invasion. Thirty-six missiles with nuclear warheads, each missile as powerful and deadly as 66 of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima. But placing nuclear missiles on Cuba is not only a political challenge, it is a threat to America's very existence. In the Oval Office, everyone agrees the missiles have to be removed. Robert Kennedy, the president's brother and attorney general, advocates a vigorous response. But when? We had a time advantage as long as the Soviets did not know that we knew. We used that time to formulate carefully our response. Until we were ready with the response, we did not want uh, the Soviets to know that a response would be forthcoming. And what will the response be? Is any response possible that doesn't rely on arms and lead to war? Is a peaceful response possible in the midst of the Cold War? A response that doesn't involve America backing down or appearing weak. A response worthy of a great power. A response that preserves life and the planet. Because nuclear war would mean the end of everything. Cuba appear confident. Havana has broken off all ties with the United States, the imperialist arch enemy across the ocean. Cuba's old memorials now serve new ideals.
Cuban children are taught the basic tenets of revolution. Colorful picture books record the victory of the revolution over the corrupt Batista regime, the march on Havana, and victory at the Bay of Pigs, the attempted U.S. invasion. And presiding over all these heroic deeds is Cuba's charismatic leader, Fidel Castro. The Castro family and the Cuban people are not afraid of anything or anybody. We are a small island and very determined. What should we fear? But the Cuban people aren't aware yet of what's happening on their island. That soon women, students, workers, office clerks will be called to arms. Fidel Castro and his brother Raul are most worried about a U.S. invasion. America is only 80 miles away as the crow flies. U.S. troops landed here once before, at the behest of the CIA, in an attempt to topple Castro's regime. So constant vigilance is the mission of this island nation, the way to preserve Cuba. Are the Soviet nuclear missiles part of the equation? Why did the Soviets place missiles here? Well, they said it was to defend Cuba. But it was also to impose an international balance of power. Cuba itself did not want any missiles. It did not need them. And yet Castro agrees to accept the missiles to serve the cause of world revolution. For two months now, merchant ships have been docking at the port of Mariel, loaded with missile components, tanks, planes, and thousands of soldiers. The biggest secret operation of the Cold War has begun. Without American knowledge, the first missiles are placed on Cuban soil. From this moment on, the clock starts ticking. The danger of discovery increases each day. The covert construction unfolds during the night. High-tech missiles travel bumpy roads. Khrushchev's game can only really begin when this cargo reaches its destination and is assembled. The sandy path behind the city of San Cristobal turns into a nuclear highway. Six launch pads are erected, sheltered by the mountains of Guaniguanico. The missiles can reach Washington, D.C. in 10 minutes. Could World War III be set in motion from this field? On this day, the Soviets and the Cubans do not realize that overhead, another American reconnaissance aircraft is in the air taking new photographs, gathering new evidence. At the same time in Washington, black limousines pull up outside the White House. U.S. Treasury Secretary Douglas Dillon, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, 
Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Attorney General Robert Kennedy. And General Maxwell Taylor, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was a, a tense meeting. It was a tense day. All of us knew that it was unprecedented, that there had never been a nuclear confrontation in the history of the world, and uh, we were about to face one. It's a meeting like none before. The mood is extremely tense. President Kennedy presses a switch under his desk, starting a tape recorder. No one knows they're being recorded. A lot is at stake. And, and I just felt something. Like it was the fear that, that uh, if we did not force the missiles out, the Soviets would move aggressively elsewhere in the world against the Western interests, against the freedom and strength of the West elsewhere in the world, was ever present in our minds. And it was a very, very deep-seated fear. The Executive Committee, or XCOM, is the hastily convened Crisis Committee, the best and the brightest, as they are later dubbed. The reconnaissance photographs are analyzed. The men focus on one question, when will the Soviet missiles become operational? Within a week, the experts estimate. Is that enough time to respond? And what should that response be? An invasion? A bombing raid? Diplomacy? Or a blockade of Cuba? Only one thing is certain. The missiles have to go. But can that be achieved without war? People around the table became weary, frustrated, fearful, sometimes uh, emotional, understandably so. It was an emotional moment in our lives and in the life of our country and our planet. They have to find an answer, but secretly, for Moscow still doesn't know how much the United States knows. The Kennedy team has to use this time wisely. All arguments should be considered. Repercussions are debated. There was a very serious risk of, of Soviet pressure on Berlin. Uh, they tried it in, in uh, 1961, in the fall, and we were concerned. Many believed that uh, if we didn't force those missiles out, they would try it again in 1962 or 63. It was a major concern. The cement of the Berlin Wall is barely dry. Built just 15 months earlier, it's a symbol of division, not just of Germany, but of the whole world. West Berlin is a thorn in the side of the Soviets, and since they can't get rid of it, they have walled it in. Berlin's you know, principal protection at that stage was the uh, pane of glass uh, theory. The Soviets knew that if they broke that pane of glass by moving in on uh, West Berlin, there would be an overwhelming Western response, nuclear or otherwise. This pane of glass surrounded by a wall is where East and West diverge. They are hostile worlds separated by a no man's land. But the calm is deceptive. It was obvious that something was in the air, and we started to consider the whole issue. Because, of course, we knew at once that if things became critical over there, they would also become critical in Berlin. Berlin was the weakest point, geographically isolated. Ich hab noch einen Koffer in Berlin. Deswegen muss ich nächstens wieder hin. West Berliners are accustomed to living with this threat and react with their own brand of dry humor. 
They also see themselves as islanders on an island of affluence. But they are at the mercy of the reverberations of international politics. When elephants start dancing, it's best for mice to step aside. And this really was... Well, it wasn't exactly a dance of the elephants, but it was a potential battle of the giants. It makes sense for everyone to stay quiet and keep out of the way, in the hope of not being trampled to death in the middle. Five hundred miles to the east, the dance has not yet begun. The Soviet Union doesn't know that its missiles have been detected. Khrushchev seems optimistic about redressing the balance of power with the U.S. and protecting Cuba. The Cuban missiles will be ready in a week. Then he will be able to present Kennedy with a fait accompli. The Americans will have to accept it, Khrushchev thinks. Khrushchev was a wishful thinker and his thought that his imagination and his vision of, of the world was a correct one almost always and on all matters <laughs> I don't think my father understood the mentality of the Americans he didn't think the White House would risk war because of those missiles. Khrushchev's foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, pays a visit to President Kennedy. It's supposed to be a routine meeting, but in fact it's another round in the game of Cuban poker. 30 minutes in which the cards could be reshuffled. I think this was a last opportunity to tell the truth for our country, I mean. Practiced friendliness, cautious exploration, a little smile for the photographers, and then a game of cat and mouse. He had the photography ready to confront Gromyko. And Gromyko denied that there was missiles in Cuba. Gromyko puts on a show, pulling out all his diplomatic tricks. Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet ambassador to Washington, is with him. Dobrynin is unaware of what's happening, not yet involved in the game. They did not inform me. Of course, it is a curious situation. If the ambassador knows nothing of an issue that defines the relationship between the two countries at that moment. Khrushchev's missile plan is top secret. Orders are that nothing can be admitted. But he made everything to, to move um, Gromyko to the confession. <laughs> Of course, um, Gromyko had no instruction, and he was not a man who was act uh, without instructions. Kennedy, from that moment, was absolutely right not to trust any statement on the part of Kremlin. And the president then said, that lying bastard. And he wouldn't have anything to do with Gromyko after that. Kennedy keeps his trump card secret. The photos remain in his desk drawer for now. Meanwhile, work on the Cuban missile site continues. Five more days until the first is ready for deployment. Construction is under the cover of darkness, making U.S. reconnaissance planes ineffective. The Soviets still believe that their camouflage is working. Soldiers from special units are made to look like agricultural experts. Machines are digging away, all to make Khrushchev's vision come true, presenting Kennedy with a fait accompli.
From these launch pads, 36 nuclear missiles with a total explosive force of 2,400 Hiroshima bombs target the U.S. On the surface, it's business as usual. President Kennedy campaigns for Democrats. Congressional elections are less than a month away. He stands before cheering crowds, appearing confident and assured. But the anxiety over Cuba is ever-present. The task of helping candidates pales before his real mission of keeping the secret until he has a plan. attention to what candidates say in the last four weeks of election. I believe the old Emersonian advice that what you are speaks far louder than what you say is the best possible advice in judging a political campaign. Campaign rhetoric. But then a curious sentence follows. Is there a double meaning? I hope uh, that you're uh, going to be available in 1964. We may need you all over again. that you're uh, going to be available in 1964. We may need you all over again. Although the election campaign is in full swing, reality is catching up with Kennedy. His executive committee is pressing for a decision, his decision. He has to return to Washington immediately, so a story is created to explain his sudden departure. Last night in Chicago, the assistant White House physician, Dr. George Berkeley, uh, noticed that the president's voice was uh, very husky. This morning when he examined the president, he found the president had developed a slight temperature and that he was suffering from a minor upper respiratory ailment. That suggested the national security affairs were possibly one of the reasons for the president returning. Is there any truth in this? The president returned because of uh, his cold and because of the advice of his doctor. A long time ago, plans for a military strike against Cuba were drawn up by the Department of Defense. There are generals who have long believed Cuba is a military, not a political problem. Now the hardliners demand action, air raids, and if that doesn't work, an invasion. General Curtis LeMay, Air Force Chief of Staff, is one of the Hawks. LeMay was like a guy with a bandolier full of grenades. And he'd walk down the Pentagon corridors and look in and throw a grenade in there and then walk down, throw a grenade over there, just to stir up people. And uh, there was an old saying that uh, if you got in a fight with LeMay, uh, always uh, you know, protect your genitals because that's where he was going to hit you. Kennedy wants to work around the generals right now, but he trusts General Maxwell Taylor, the man he appointed as head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Kennedy was disgusted both with his, some of his own actions and the advice he had received. He was mistrustful of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The only person in uniform in those days he seemed to have confidence in was my father. Maxwell Taylor has an office in the White House, close to Kennedy. The only military man on the executive committee. His job is to restrain the other generals and tame the Hawks. This was President Kennedy's way of saying, I want Taylor's advice here, and I value it more than I do those of the Joint Chiefs in the Pentagon. This doesn't please General LeMay. He wants direct access to the president so he can push his plan. When they asked him about what he do, Cuba, he said, I'll fry it. That's easy. But he was determined that... Uh, I hate like hell to say this, but uh, I think he would have liked to have 
unleashed his bomber force. Pressure from the armed forces now dominates all discussion in the White House. Some members of XCOM agree with the generals. There is concern that Americans will demand firm action once it's known there are nuclear missiles in Cuba aimed at the U.S. Kennedy and his brother want a resolution that avoids immediate armed conflict. They want disposal of the missiles without war. How can this be done? Will threats work? Or will Khrushchev regard threats as a weakness to exploit? Kennedy believes it's crucial to appear completely resolute. No option can be ruled out, including an invasion. Khrushchev has to recognize that he has no choice and the U.S. armed forces have to be kept on alert. LeMay's bombers can be useful as a fist under a glove. Within the executive committee, one idea is gaining popularity. It's an unusual scheme, using U.S. ships in a blockade of Cuba. No shots will have to be fired, at least initially. Uh, put the ball in Khrushchev's court. Put the decision to him as to whether to go further up the ladder of escalation. We did not wish to do so. We did not want to drive him into a corner where his only choice was humiliation or escalation. Hundreds of U.S. Navy vessels can form a ring around the island, preventing Khrushchev's ships from reaching Cuba. It can be a first step, but will it be enough? A blockade, uh, even if, as it would be expected, it would be fully effective in stopping any uh, introduction of new weapons, it wouldn't itself alone do anything about getting rid of the weapons that were already in Cuba. The U.S. armed forces have to prepare for all military options against Cuba, as the quarantine could fail. 250,000 men, hundreds of tanks, more than a thousand aircraft are readied. Florida is put in a state of emergency, although it's officially labeled a practice maneuver. How long can all this be kept a secret from the public? It was an armed camp. It was absolutely bristling with everything we had. And I was confident that if we did make the decision to invade Cuba, that we could do so successfully. In Key West, people guess that all this activity has something to do with Cuba, with intimidating Castro. Many are Cuban exiles who long for the overthrow of the regime. Something is in the air, and a few journalists become suspicious. One of the major newspapers of the country uh, indicated that they had knowledge that we had photographs of missiles in Cuba, Soviet missiles in Cuba, and that they were planning to, to announce that. And the president then did something that was very unusual. He called the publisher and asked him not to publish that information. The publisher complies with the request. That's the only time that has happened that in the seven years I was secretary. But one reporter in Washington follows a lead. We went to a place in Georgetown in Washington called the Carriage House. And there I saw a group of uh, people I knew from the State Department, uh, high-level officials in the areas of um, the Caribbean, which would include Cuba, of course. I had immediate suspicion, so I went over to them and said, hi, fellas, uh, what are you all doing together on a Sunday after the evening? Uh, sitting around here having dinner together and they all turned green they wouldn't tell me anything but i went back home and i made a lot of phone calls around to people i knew and came to the conclusion that there were indeed offensive missiles potentially nuclear in cuba 
uh, by the Soviets. I called New York, talked to the desk at the New York Herald Tribune, my paper, and dictated a story. So as far as I know, that was the first uh, hard story that there were indeed missiles in Cuba. Time is running out. News is leaking. Kennedy has to make what will be the most important speech in his life. President Kennedy will address the nation tonight on radio and television on a subject of the highest national urgency. The White House asked for the time shortly after noon today. The president has been engaged this morning in a number of meetings uh, with key people in the administration. Newspaper stories are about to come out, but the public still hasn't been told what's going on. The Cuban Missile Crisis is still a secret, but not for much longer. The White House is besieged by the press. Reporters from the Soviet Union are also invited for the first time in years. They will experience the drama of this historic moment firsthand. From the desks of the correspondents, the tension is transmitted around the world, as is endless speculation. In Moscow, speculation is also rife. Khrushchev is alerted by the foreign ministry, and the leading figures in the Communist Party are quickly assembled. They await the Soviet leader. A collective guessing game begins in the foyer. Have the missiles in Cuba been spotted? Has the whole thing been uncovered? Khrushchev is on his way to his headquarters, his mind occupied with many thoughts. Kennedy must know about the missiles, no doubt about it. How will Kennedy react? Should Khrushchev expect the worst? If the American president gives in to pressure from his armed forces and mounts an attack, an attack on Cuba, then an invasion of 250,000 American troops could be stopped with one atomic bomb. Then the Americans would be dead, their ships sunk. What would Kennedy do then? He would deploy his own nuclear weapons. But then what? The United States is unaware that a short-range nuclear weapon is already in place on Cuba. Unlike the big bombs, these are tactical weapons designed for the battlefield. They're called Lunas. They can be used to eliminate thousands of attackers in one stroke. Could the Lunas trigger World War III? The Americans didn't know. They didn't know anything about those tactical nuclear weapons on Cuba. If they had attacked, I believe the commander of our forces there, General Pliev, would have used those weapons. On October 22, 1962, President John F. Kennedy broadcast a special message to the nation from his office in the White House. Here is President Kennedy as he delivered that message bearing on recent events in Cuba. Ten seconds to go. Never before have so many waited so anxiously for the words of an American president. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, Unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, where they're found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. The message was we were determined to get the missiles out and we, and we were prepared to, f to fight to get them out. 
but uh, in the meantime, there is a period where we're not going to fight. We're going to impose a quarantine, and that's implied a time for negotiation. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. All U.S. armed forces go to defense condition DEFCON 3. It's just two levels away from war, but still no more than a threatening gesture. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. Retaliation would come in the form of B-52s, the core of the American nuclear bomber fleet. There are more than 500 available, 66 of which are constantly in the air, directly threatening the Soviet Union. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere and we hope around the world god willing that goal will be achieved thank you and good night did the president strike the right note with this mixture of strength and caution he wants to keep options open avoiding talk of an invasion in havana Cuban officials hear Kennedy's speech, and a conference of leading party figures is called. They're now in a heightened state of alert. Although Kennedy didn't mention an invasion, he did talk about further measures. Cuba has to be prepared for every possibility. On the first day, we mobilized 170,000 men. In total, there were over a quarter of a million warriors in the trenches. Socialismo or muerte. Socialism or death. Although it's thousands of miles away, Germany is very close to the conflict. It always has the potential to be a future battleground for nuclear exchange between the two superpowers. The United States informs its German allies of the situation. Late night talks are held with German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. His opinion is clear. Do not back down on any account. Now is the time to drive a wedge between Castro and Khrushchev. One of Adenauer's ideas was that Castro's role should be played up because making Castro out to be the bad guy would give Khrushchev the opportunity to back down without losing face. I think that was Adenauer's basic concept. He was a sly fox, you know. Adenauer's advice was that Kennedy must follow through on what he has announced. Too much time has already gone by. Castro has been allowed to do as he pleases for too long. The same goes for Khrushchev, who divided Germany with a wall. The German leader believes the balance of power will be disturbed if Kennedy fails to act resolutely. The blockade allows the Kremlin to sound the all clear at least temporarily. Cuba is not going to be attacked for the time being. Naturally, there was a sense of relief when Kennedy announced the blockade. Because in the language of diplomacy, that means I am prepared to negotiate. Khrushchev wants to demonstrate that there is no need to panic. The public will not see an agitated Soviet leadership heading home. The conference room becomes their dormitory. In the adjoining room, where the only bed has been prepared, Khrushchev lies down knowing his plan hasn't succeeded. 
But he has no intention of backing down yet. The game of poker has just begun. But is the high stakes game worth the risk? This is where the decisive showdown will take place. Kennedy's armada is moving into position. 60 heavily armed ships form a ring of steel and cannons. Will it be impenetrable? We had heard the president say that we were going to uh, intercept shipping. So the very first question that the commanding officer of the VSOL directed at me was, uh, uh, Commodore, what do I do if uh, we intercept uh, a ship approaching Cuba? And uh, he refuses to stop when I ask him to stop. Standard procedure is a single shot across the bow. If this doesn't stop the ship, then guns are fired to disable it. And finally, the ship is boarded. But wouldn't the firing of guns mean war? It was a mistake, I think, not to have uh, considered before the imposition of the blockade what exactly were to be the rules of engagement for our ships. It's possible that there could have been uh, a very serious international incident. A single ship, a single captain, a single pilot acting prematurely could trigger all-out war. All morning, papers carry just one headline, Cuba blockaded. Hundreds of millions read it, knowing this could be the beginning of nuclear war. There was great concern for the families in those days. Uh, I can recall when I got off alert that Tuesday following uh, uh, President Kennedy's address, uh, telling my wife to prepare a survival kit, blankets, medicines, uh, and all kinds of paraphernalia, put it in the automobile, be prepared uh, to move at a moment's notice, watch the news, stay abreast of what was going on, and, and to be ready to move in, in short notice. Move in short notice, but where to? Would any place be spared if nuclear weapons were deployed? Which corner of the earth will be left intact when the world fell victim to man's whims? When a single flash destroys a world that took millions of years to create? The night after the speech, President Kennedy signs papers that put the naval blockade of Cuba into effect. It is a signature into uncertainty. Seven thousand miles to the east, Kennedy's Soviet adversary spends the night at the theater. Just before, Khrushchev openly condemns the blockade as an unacceptable act of piracy. But now he is going to enjoy the opera. Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov. The story of Tsar Boris, who rids himself of another Tsar. Is it a message of sorts? During any crisis, there are a number of signals that may appear insignificant at first, but they do have meaning. torment. There is an unknown fear within me, a terrible premonition. The man singing the words in Russian is an American on tour. 
He is going to have champagne with Khrushchev afterward and drink a toast to world peace. Look at this. Even though a blockade has been announced, we are chatting with an American opera singer. That was our way of indicating that we also wanted to negotiate. My soul is in torment. There is an unknown fear within me. Terrible premonition? The questions are asked, but Soviet vessels are sailing full steam ahead. And the Soviet ships were approaching that quarantine line with no indication that they were going to do anything other than continue towards Cuba. If they try to violate that quarantine line, are we going to be the first to use military force? About 20 Russian ships are still heading for Cuba. One loaded with nuclear warheads reaches its destination just minutes before the American blockade closes. What will happen to the others? We were sitting there looking at the television pictures. Our ships, 10 miles away, then 5 miles away. It was like an American Western. Will there be a showdown? When will the first round be fired? U.S. destroyers are told to fire only on orders from the White House. But suddenly, most Soviet freighters, the ones loaded with weapons, turn around. The remaining vessels stay on course to Cuba. Is it a sign of confusion or cool calculation? It was our way of saying, we will not send our ships across the line you have established. And Kennedy got the message. He did not even try to stop the Soviet tanker, the Bucharest, or the East German passenger ship. The East German cruise ship, Volker Freundschaft, is touring the Caribbean. One of the passengers, Willy Schaefer, is filming on board. Inadvertently, the cruise ship becomes a blockade buster. Someone said we would come under fire. Some people were expecting that to happen, 